is uh, chief legal counsel for the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. His organization has led the effort in Israel to uncover information about Prisoner X. The Israeli Supreme Court has just today lifted a gag order on the group's role in the case. And we're joined by Anthony Lowenstein, who is joining us from Sydney, Australia, via Democracy Now! video, journalist and author, co-founder of Independent Australian Jewish Voices. Um, Anthony, let's begin with you. If you could start off by just laying out what this case is all about, um, who this man was. In short, uh, this gentleman's identity was not known, as you said, until last week. We knew a little bit about the case a few years ago when the Israeli press reported that a gentleman had committed suicide in Israeli prison. We knew nothing else. Fast forward to last week, and the foreign correspondent program on local television broke the story, and it's gone global since. What essentially has come out in the last week has been a litany of information which really goes to the heart, I think, of what regularly happens between Australia and Israel. On the one hand, what happens to this gentleman, Ben Sigia, is unique. Not that many Israeli Australians die in Israeli prisons, either murdered or suicide. That's true. But on the other hand, the facilitation by the Australian Jewish establishment and the Australian intelligence services of young Jews to Israel to live there, to obviously serve in the IDF and sometimes work for Mossad is not that unusual. It doesn't get talked about. The press doesn't really examine it very often, but it's not that unusual. And it goes to the heart in some ways of what the Jewish Zionist lobby here is about in Australia and indeed in many Western countries, including in your country, the US, which is to facilitate and blindly support Israeli um, security. Uh, uh yeah, it's only in regard to the proceedings we initiated two years ago. Um, ACRI heard for the first time about Prisoner X in June 2010, six months before his death, and we addressed the Attorney General raising our concern about the prisoner uh, uh, being totally isolated and under complete secrecy. Uh, a few days after we heard about his uh, death in mid-December, uh, we filed a motion with the district court to uh, lift the gag order or at least limit its uh, sweeping scope to allow uh, publication of, of, of some details about the charges brought against him and especially the concern about how he found, he found his, yeah, how, how he was found dead in, in the most protected uh, cell of the prison services. Um, after the district court dismissed uh, our motion, we filed an appeal with the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court heard the appeal on February two years ago. Um, but the judges also were, uh, uh, the, the judges, also the judges on the Supreme Court had the security services for an hour and a half, a sparte, and after that they told us they were convinced that the, the whole, uh, uh, that, that the, the complete secrecy is justified. But, uh, then what happened after you learned he had, quote, committed suicide? Uh, in May 2010, there was a short-lived report on, a, on, a, on an Israeli uh, news site, uh, uh, Ynet, regarding a prisoner X held in the Ayalon prison in complete isolation, and even the prison guards uh, don't know his identity and are, are prohibited from talking uh, uh, to him. Uh, after a few hours, the, the, the report vanished, and it raised our concern uh, regarding the, the rights of the uh, prisoner and uh, the conditions that he, he is held, both with, uh, uh, but also the, the complete secrecy around the affair. And we tried to gather some uh, details about it, but couldn't, and that's why we addressed the Attorney General for the first time. Uh, six months month later, we got a, uh, information from a, uh, from a source connected to the media about uh, his being found.
dead in his cell, and, and then we filed the motion with the court. Time, in the case of Anat Khan, a, a soldier in the IDF who uh, was charged and convicted of, of, of copying hundreds of classified uh, documents, uh, um, and other cases in, in the in in the past, there, there were a few exceptional cases where uh, uh, prisoners were held uh, um, under false identity uh, uh, for years. Uh, and the, the most notable one is Dr. Markus Klinberg, a biologist uh, uh, um, who was uh, convicted of espionage on behalf of the USSR, and he was held during most of his uh, uh, years in prison under false identity, and, and his trial was under complete secrecy. Australian Broadcasting Corporation TV documentary that exposed the identity of Prisoner X. Uh, in this, a former Australian intelligence agent, Warren Reed, expresses skepticism about claims that Ben Zagir committed suicide. There are lots of ways nowadays where you can pick up the extent to which the person in the cell is sweating, um, the, their heartbeat, or all sorts of things. I mean, modern technology applied in, that, in a cell like that almost totally precludes any possibility of someone like him sanitised in that way could hang themselves, I find it almost impossible to believe. One imprisonment suggested that the case was very sensitive. The degree of sanitization of, of this gentleman, um, where he was put in Unit 15 in that uh, prison, which was constructed only as one cell, and hermetically sealing him away in all human terms, even within the prison, from his society, his family. Uh, that suggests that it has to be something very, very touchy and very immediate. Otherwise, you wouldn't go to those lengths. Uh, the allegations that uh, that this man, that Ben Zagir, was um, involved with the assassination of Mahmoud al Mabou, the Hamas official, um, uh, who was killed in Dubai in a hotel room that we all came to see on closed-circuit television. I have no information in regard of, of, of the charges that were brought against him. Repeat that. I have no information in regard to the charges brought against him. But in terms of, uh, of what uh, Warren Reed was saying, the Australian agent, uh, to do with suicide? Uh, the, yesterday, uh, uh, the, the magistrate court uh, allowed to uh, uh, publish a part of the decision of the judge that investigated the circumstances of his death, and according to the finding of the judge, it was a suicide, uh, uh, because according to the tapes, the radio, the, the cameras, uh, no one entered uh, the cell. And I accept that, the, the, but another important finding of the investigative judge was that uh, uh, that prison guards are uh, uh, should be charged uh, uh, um, negligently causing his death, uh, uh, and we are awaiting the decision of the attorney, the state attorney. In, re uh, in regard of charges that will be brought uh, against uh, senior officials of the prison services. Most of the public, uh, unfortunately, the security services and think that whatever they deem to be secret is a, should be a secret. But I think the tragic result of this whole affair, I hope, will serve as a watershed, that this whole affair will be a, a watershed, a positive suspicion against the security services, either a conscious or unconscious interest uh, to uh, cover up happenings during their operation. And how does this compare to treatment of Palestinian prisoners? Um, 
Usually, Palestinian prisoners are not held under secret conditions or in isolation, but 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 there was also the case of the engineer Abu Sisi from Gaza, who allegedly was kidnapped by the the, the Mossad from a train in Kiev, and charges were was were brought against him. Of, of being involved in, in the rocket firing on, on Israel, and his, at first the, the mere fact that he was arrested was under a gag order after we uh, filed a motion that this, this was lifted, but his whole trial is also uh, conducted uh, behind closed doors. Had a very kind of benign statement saying that we're encouraged by the fact that Israel and Australia will undergo a investigation, which I suspect will be a bit of a whitewash. The Australian government is embarrassed because the details of this case remain murky. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that during the Dubai hit on the Hamas operative in 2010, the Australian passports were used and forged for that mission, amongst other countries as well. And the Australian government publicly at the time was pretty upset about this, as other governments were as well. But in private, I've heard from a variety of sources that, in fact, the reality was that this sort of thing is known to happen. Many governments do it, including our own government, my government, the Australian government. Um, so officially, the Australian and the Israelis would like this issue to disappear. And one of the things that's become very clear in Australia in the last week, and indeed this is reflected, I think, in the fact that the Australian uh, Jewish establishment sees its role as endorsing and enforcing what Israel does, whether it's backing the occupation or supporting a strike on Iran. All those things fit into this narrative, which is young Jews who go to young Jewish schools in Australia. Australia is one of the most pro-Israel countries in the world, along with South Africa and, of course, obviously um, the US. That it's not that surprising this sort of thing has happened. The details are unique. But the facilitation of a gentleman like Ben Zigia to undergo these kind of actions by Mossad is not that unusual. It just doesn't usually get talked about in the press. And this has been discussed in the wider press, in the wider media, and indeed in many public forums in the last week, has been a lot of Australians are uncomfortable with the fact that an Australian citizen can go to Israel, become an Israeli citizen, join the IDF, undergo... Um, some kind of training and potentially work for Mossad and commit acts which are in any definition of breaches of international law, whether it's the assassination of Hamas leaders in um, Dubai or involved in other strikes against Iranian nuclear scientists. So many people feel uncomfortable about this. So one of the things that we do see in Australia and we see it in the US and many countries is when Israel, for example, um, starts a war, whether it's against Lebanon or Gaza or elsewhere, you see a number of Australian Jewish dual nationals go to Israel to fight in the IDF with those with the, with, with the Israeli military. And that sort of thing, I think, makes a lot of Australians uncomfortable, rightly so in my view. And I think there needs to be a real question here, and this is one of the things that's being talked about in circles, not so much publicly in the Australian Jewish community, but certainly privately and indeed in the wider press, that why does the Australian government feel comfortable facilitating young Jews to move to Israel and potentially commit acts of arguably, in certain cases, terrorism or at least breaches of international law in Gaza or Lebanon or Dubai, wherever Ben Zigia may have been but behaving. Anthony Possibly, Amy, yes. But one of the things that also is involved in this story is that the Australian intelligence services knew what Ben Zigia was doing. One of the things that remains unclear is exactly why the Israelis arrested Ben Ziggy and put him in high security prison. Was it because he was leaking information to the Australian intelligence services? Was he about to break some story to the press? Was there a crisis of conscience? We don't know. These certainly are allegations that have been talked about here by a number of reliable sources and indeed in Israel as well. So, yes, the Australian intelligence services publicly are talking about an investigation, but just like in the US, they are incredibly opaque. There is not really any kind of legis legislative transparency in the way ASIO, which is the intelligence services here, operates. So as much as we like to think that there would be some kind of investigation which is released publicly, the sad reality is that both Australia and Israel would like the situation to remain as it is today. In other words, very, very close relationship.